Welcome everyone to episode 20. How did you think we'd make it 20 episodes? No, I, I'm surprised we made it to six. I well. thought we were going to pack it in. <laughs> <laughs> episode 20 at Top of Mind. It is March 23rd, 9.53 a.m. Pacific time. And wow, there's been a lot of news. We had two quick podcasts uh, from some emergency news from Silicon Valley Bank. We are going to retouch that today a little bit because there's been some developments since then and some contagion, dare I use the the big word. You know, we go from like transient um, to, to, well, now I'm forgetting, but contagion is now the word of the day. We will touch on the Fed rate hike. They hiked a quarter of a percent uh, this week and what that also means for rates and a couple of other things. So how, where should we start today? Yeah, I, I think we timestamp it. It's uh, Thursday, March 23rd at 10 a.m. Pacific, and the market is up post-Fed, right? The market's up over a percent. More buyers uh, than sellers. More, A lot more buyers. Uh, this was after initial negative reaction yesterday when Jay Powell did his press conference. As per usual, he created a lot of volatility with his free speaking ways and Initially, the market was up and then down pretty sharply. Now it's up again. So we are. I feel, I feel like he should just. I feel like he should just announce and then and then not say. Walk anything. away. Yeah. Yeah. Turn yeah, off the yeah, mic. yeah. Yeah. Turn yeah. turn off the mic. Just hey, here's what we're doing, everybody, <laughs> and no further questions. Well, again, the the press conferences are relatively new since Bernanke, right? I understood, <laughs> understand why he needed to be transparent, but uh, Bernanke for everyone. Uh, reference is was well, around 2010 2009 uh, obviously he needed to talk down some of the panic uh, here I think we're creating our own panic right and I I think we're creating our own mistakes and I'm referring to we as the Fed because I'm notably a Fed member right so so I have nothing to do with the Fed but uh, I'm speaking as if I'm part of the Fed and I think they're making a lot of mistakes and I think the press conferences are coming out poorly or being interpreted poorly because I don't, I don't know if we should be rallying on the news, but again, we, we've always been of the corner of investors. If you don't know, because who, who really is jumping in? Obviously someone's jumping in, but what kind of green light are we getting here? I guess we'll get into that, but there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of reasons to be so optimistic. At least in my talking banks opinion. specifically or everywhere? I think it stems from banks, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think our since our topic is SBB, Silicon Valley Bank, I think there's a lot of fallout from this that we're still seeing issues with. Uh, not quite much in the headlines, but we're seeing quite a bit of outflows from smaller regional banks. And I, yeah. I think that's one of the topics of debate today. And... Should bank runs create more bank runs? I don't know. It depends on your situation, right? Like, uh, what I mean is, if you're above the FDIC limit and you run a business, like, what what are you going to do in your best interest to protect that, protect your employees, mm -hmm. versus a single depositor? My, let's say my family household, where we're, we don't have our savings in anywhere near FDIC limits. Are we okay? leaving our money where it is most likely but at the same time how disruptive is it if you're a business then and you're well above 250 even below 250 mm -hmm. if you're a smaller business right and the money's suddenly frozen from withdrawals that is so disruptive i mean it's not that big of a business to have an every two week payroll to be over two hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars and so yeah. if you logged in on monday and you could only access two hundred fifty thousand dollars and you can't run payroll I mean, that is, I can't imagine sending that email. Yeah. Like, hi, everyone. We have the money. The money's not there, but though. But it's literally so frozen. We, it's literally frozen. So, like, we're really sorry, but we, we actually can't pay you today. And we don't actually know when we can pay you, but but we have the money. What a painful <laughs> email to send. Yeah. So, uh, I guess, understandably, like, anyone outside of SBB but banking at regional banks across the, the nation, there have been massive flows out of these banks. Yeah. So what do are they going to do? Is, 
is there real time data on that? Like, do we have sort of the how much money flew out of regional banks and even better if it's by percentage. And then of course yeah. we know where it's going, right? It's going to all the big banks, which is not good for the system, which we'll touch on here in a bit, but do we have yeah. data on that. Well, right now it is self-reported from the regional banks, like how much is moving out of their system. Okay. But we are looking at like the, the flows into the money markets, which I think could be hmm. a conversation is like, is my money market money safe? I think I, I can't think of a safer place in the entire world to put money than the money markets, right? They yeah. do they do pay a much healthier uh, interest rate, which is closer to what the the Fed's been pushing is about mm-hmm. five five ish percent. Uh, where if you're banking at a big bank, good luck getting one percent. And we yeah. mentioned this before, right? Why why don't the big banks offer uh, more healthy interest rates on our savings? Because I need the money. I th- yeah, I, I said we didn't need. They didn't need the money, and they're in a position where they don't need more of the money now, right? Mm-hmm. And so what they're getting is is inflows from smaller banks or deposits from smaller banks looking for relative safety. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, I, I guess it'll be a little bit until we really see the aftermath of this, but I. Hmm. What I was going to say was I can't see a scenario where then money flows back from these big banks to the small banks. I hope that statement is wrong because small banks, and and you have some data on this, small banks are incredibly important to the banking system in terms of percentage of loans, in terms of business loans, in terms of how much business these small regional banks do relative to, you know, the Chase's and the Wells Fargo's of the world. Do you have some data on that that you can share with our listeners? Yeah, for the entire economy, right? They they cover more than half of commercial real estate deals, cover wow. more than half of all small business medium business loans, more than half of all the residential residential loans. So, wow. let's just cut half of that business. The economy shrinks in half. Like that's that's yeah. trillions of dollars at stake, right? Yeah. Um, if these banks are suddenly unable to fill their deposits, right? then they suddenly can't, the next logical step is they suddenly can't make these loans, which are so vital to our economy. I think that that's a big worry. Yeah. Um, so you're saying the, the, the fallout here is if I don't have deposits, I can't make a loan. So if I'm a small bank and I've got 10 people, you know, coming in today to, to, to do a take their money home on. loan or whatever, or, or well, now I'm saying I'm do a loan. I, I yeah. might be only able to approve two of those because I actually don't have the deposits in order to legally loan out more money than yeah. that. So that's the trickle down effect of this is deposits are required. And that's a lot of times why banks will incent deposits with higher interest rates. They're required in order for banks to actually lend, which is how yeah. the cycle goes around. And that's what the fallout of this is. Yeah. And I think it's not going to happen overnight and we're going to have a solution. Uh, but the Fed raised rates on March 22nd mm-hmm. and Jay Powell was saying that the banks are largely doing the Fed's job by tightening credit, right? Uh, we've mentioned mm. the flow of credit being so vital to growth of an economy because the, the multiplier exponential effect of money growth. Mm-hmm. Uh, once that halts, that's going to be a big issue. I, we mentioned regional banks serving more than 50% of the entire you know, business activity, but do JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Bank of America kind of lower their their service base? Because mm-hmm. all these banks offer like a private wealth client or a mega wealth client, right? And to even talk to a live person now, you got to have millions of dollars in business with them. Mm-hmm. Do they have the scalability to come down to where and serve the community that the regional banks served? Mm-hmm. One, I, I doubt it. And two... They have shareholders to maintain their interest too. So if they're spending too much on the lower end of the scale, where it's not profit as profitable to them, it just doesn't make sense to do business there. I mean, and I think dec- yeah. Just a real quick, a decent example is maybe what Goldman Sachs is going through with the Marcus product. And yeah. For those that don't follow that, the Marcus product was Goldman's attempt to really reach kind of the the normal consumer. Goldman's marketing and Goldman's business is really for the ultra, ultra high net worth. Uh, 
they launched this market Marcus product to try to get to normal people. And it is a huge flop. They've lost billions on it and they're in the process of shutting it down. Yeah. Right. And the Marcus for a while was giving what 3% interest rates on your savings. They were account. one of the best ones. Yeah. When you'd Google yeah. high yield savings accounts and you know, nerd wallet comes up, Marcus was consistently one of the best ones. Yeah. But if you got a clear 3% in liabilities, that's a lot of money probably even more so in this market where your regional bank, you're a startup bank like Marcus, obviously not Marcus anymore, but if you need to attract new deposits, it comes with strings, right? Right. You can't, you don't have the, the power of bank of America where stability is inherent. Mm -hmm. So you have to compensate for, by paying more interest, which is a lot more expensive to you than, than the big mega banks. I think one of the keys coming out of this is that, this this whole banking, I would call it a crisis that we're in here, it's not due to bad loans. It's not due to uh, foreclosures on homes. It's not due to people not paying their car payments. That's a separate issue. There is an uptick in that stuff, but uh, it's, not, it's not really meaningful. It truly is due to the run on the bank and then this issue with this bond sale. There's been a lot of news on how Silicon Valley Bank was yeah. poorly managed. Uh, you know, they had missed timing. I, I guess I have mixed views on this other than just throwing darts at the, the one in the room that's failed. Let's unpack that a little bit. I'd love to hear your thoughts, how on, on, you know, what happened? What, what do you, what do you think they, they should have done differently? Or was this just wrong place, one wrong time? You know, they basically have one client and that one client left all at once. Yeah. The, the Eagle eared listeners will recall that we did touch on this briefly, but I glossed over it um, because, yeah, the, the fallout was still falling out. We didn't we yeah. didn't really have a strong idea of what happened because when we recorded it, it was that Monday following that Friday collapse. So we literally had two days to sit on it, and uh, now a few day, few more days have passed. But uh, Chris mentioned that SVB didn't take outsized risk, and I actually agree with that because um, if we take what they owned were treasuries, right? Everyone talks about how much longer dated maturities that they had. Um, they did have more than the average bank in terms of asset size, how much w was funneled to the treasuries, um, which we came to, came to light that they did not hedge interest rates. Um, big institutions, pension funds can hedge out interest rate risk by just buying swaps. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll get, that's probably a very nerdy topic that we should gloss over, but Essentially, if rates rise, if you hedge, that, that hedge position offsets any kind of losses on your bonds. Right. So they didn't have that. So how much can they hedge? Well, hedging costs money, right? You got to give up upside or you got to pay for essentially insurance, right? Right. As a as IBB is, is the ticker, they're publicly traded and they have shareholders who say eke out profits. Mm -hmm. So don't hedge too much, right, in case you're wrong because hedges – come with the cost. So that's one part. Uh, to to say they took too much risk is probably a bit a gross over exaggeration. The, these were US treasuries, right? And they bought the majority of the portfolio would have matured in three years. So if they managed to survive through this without having to touch those bonds, they would have got 100% of their bonds back. Right. Right. So I think the other part what Chris mentioned, or other two parts, was the heavy concentration of of startups and VC money that flows through there. Right, half of their deposit base was startups, mm -hmm. right? And the other part was ignited by Twitter, uh, social media. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the big money founders pulled out their money and then said, "Hey, you also take your money out," mm -hmm. and they they created their own run, right? So 25% of the depositors in a tightly connected community, right? We're talking about the startup VC community in one s single geographic area, mm -hmm. all taking that same advice. And in the past, they, they would have to line up in, at a bank and pull their money out physically. That doesn't really exist anymore. You just log onto your phone and transfer the money out in an instant, the money's gone. And that's so, how 50 billion can leave in a day. Yeah. <laughs> so I know there's some pictures of people lining up at SVB, which to me in this day and age doesn't make sense to line up. 
but That's bank runs in the, yeah make bank runs in the past uh specifically in the great recession or great depression sorry that people would line up around the block to take their money on right that's the bank right. run you actually went to the bank yeah yeah here it's all happening electronically in an instant so right. when founders like uh peter Thiel take 100 million out and tell and tell everyone after the fact that he took a million out and they should take their million out creates a conundrum right it, i don't know if he did the right thing or the wrong thing but i think that's that leads to a lot of other questions where a lot of famous VC founders and and investors use their influence to either perpetuate the the fear and panic or do did the right thing and told everyone hey if you're a company and you need to make payroll you you should act in your best interest so yeah. how do you weigh those two yeah and it, it's it's been said that this is the first social social media influenced bank run which is interesting right that's how fast news travels these days versus you know 100 years ago you didn't know that a bridge fell immediately yeah. you found out about that days later and so the the contagion effect was contained just within that small community rather than you know spread across the the area there was a, a bridge I, I say that because there was a bridge that actually fell uh north of Seattle. And then, you know, immediately after there's all these articles about how the health of all the bridges in the area is all terrible and every single other bridge could fall. And, you know, everything gets under the microscope when an incident happens, which is sort of what's happening here too. Every bank is under the microscope because this incident happened. And, uh, from all that, I haven't heard coming back to bridges. I haven't heard of all these bridges getting repaired or there's new budgets for them. Well, maybe Seattle it's just bridge. not in the news. <laughs> That's that bridge is the bane of my existence. So everyone, just for personal, in the last two years we've been going up to Seattle from Sacramento to visit family, mm -hmm. and they live in West Seattle. And yeah. obviously everything's in Seattle proper. And the West Seattle bridge being down creates a ten minute commute, like turns a ten minute commute into hour commute easily because you true. had to go around the bay. Yeah. And we left last year, and what a month later the West Seattle bridge completed its repairs so <laughs> so i think i think yeah uh fixing that bridge was obviously vital but yeah i think the the contagion of of bridges being unsafe yeah isn't anything new right um i posted an article here on the sheet here chris uh yeah yeah morgan Housel wrote about the brooklyn bridge opened in 1883 and people were this is the longest bridge that people have seen just in general so they they start questioning its viability. Is it going to fall on me if I walk across? Right. Right. And uh, they actually had to bring in P.T. Barnum, the, the circus guy, have, have him trot elephants across the bridge to show how sound it was. Mm -hmm. But even then, when it was open to the public, people were set in, in one panic issue where a lady tripped over the stairs, and then all of a sudden people thought the bridge was collapsing. And what <laughs> what happened right when this first lady said oh no the bridge, bridge is collapsing rush to the exits right yep exactly. i think that's what we got from twitter and all these loud speakers um saying the bridge is collapsing which caused uh, another pileup but caused another incident and i think that's that's dangerous but i think what we're putting out there is is it the right thing to do which is really gray there mm -hmm. because yeah. if you would, pulled your money would, and said nothing would, would anything have happened would, the would bank silicon have valley bank yeah. had failed yeah if all the money wasn't pulled yeah but because the money was slowly running off because vc funding had dried up and yeah. the cash bounces were coming down but would the timing of those bonds which matured in about three years i believe on average been on they, par, yeah, with the yep. outflows. And now you don't have a 10% loss. Now you don't have to issue stock. Now the bank doesn't blow up. We'll never know, but that is an interesting, that's an interesting viewpoint. So anyway, yeah. I don't know if I buy into the horribly managed blah, 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 blah. I, I don't know if I, I get it yet. If somebody out there understands this better than me, tell me. I would love to be educated on it. Um, I, I'm not defending the management team there. I'm just not, I think it is easy to simply just throw darts and say, well, clearly yeah. they mismanaged. 
Um, you can't plan for 50 billion to walk out your door in a day. No bank can plan on that by percentage. That was like 25% of their deposits or more. Correct. But the cascading effect to other banks now, even ones that aren't even related to the tech space, yep. are suffering from outflows. So how let's, do you mitigate that, right? And let's they, talk they about are. that. Let's talk about First Republic Bank. Yeah. So yeah. First Republic Bank has been in the news a ton. Their stock is down 90% in a week. What is going on here? First Republic Bank, very similar to Silicon Valley, where the high concentration is in that entrepreneurial startup space. Hmm. And yeah, the couple lifelines have been thrown at them. They got a, they were successful in getting a pretty large loan to back those d deposits, yeah. or at this point, back the money that that flowed out of the bank. So they're somehow surviving this. Uh, at least the stock is. So again, we could probably get into uh, how I view that as a value value trap. Um, people might have heard. Don't try to catch a falling knife, mm. but what if they survive? What what is the what does the stock do in response? Right? Um, yeah. There's a strong chance it goes to zero, which which I think true value investing. Um, that's probably extreme value where you're you're buying something that's so price price so low mm -hmm. that a bounce back becomes exponentially positive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a big risk, though. That's a big if, right? If I just go back to Warren Buffett buying banks in 2009, which mm -hmm. he, he has benefited very, very materially from. And again, that's from an investor point of view. First Republic, I have no clue if it's going to survive or not. It sounds like there are banks, bigger banks scrambling to, to keep it funded. Yeah. Because yeah. the fallout of that is more more regionals will start falling, falling down, and then all of a sudden, these big inflows to big banks are going to keep occurring. I thought the coolest thing that happened there, and I, I posted this on on LinkedIn for for folks that are following me. Uh, there were uh, five or six banks that all came out and gave a loan to First Republic, and it was the big banks. It was it was all the banks that were benefiting from money going out of First Republic. So it was Chase, and it was Wells, and. Uh, Morgan Stanley actually also stepped in. So there's a handful of, of, of banks. And uh, essentially what happened was they said, you know, we've seen this uptick in deposits of X billions. We'll just give it back to you. And they did that because, again, fundamentally, banks just simply need the deposits in order to stay solvent. Solvency is just a math problem. And so this loan, and, and there's some stipulations, you know, it has to stay there for at least 120 days and this sort of thing. Um, and this was orchestrated by Jamie Dimon, who's been quite top of news uh, with all of this stuff. But, um, you know, hopefully something like that just parks cash in the bank to give it some stability and allows the bank to regain confidence with the public and on Wall Street and then just simply get back to business. Any other thoughts on that, though? Yeah, well, I think there's comments on Jamie Dimon being so involved with a lot of glo uh, national crises uh people have kind of called him like the hero complex type where mm -hmm. he wanted to be the savior of the entire country uh, maybe some of that ego is in play but i think some of it is self-preservation for jp morgan right it, they're they're a bank that that's too big to fail and but if they suddenly get bigger let's say they double in size is that good for competition, good for the economy. I, I, I've just mentioned that they have a private bank where you need, I believe it's $10 million to get. Uh, I think that's uh, right. Yeah, one of those wealth people who who has $10 million in business with a single entity like that. 99% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. of the Americans don't, and that's, that's the issue. Yeah. Well, and that, again, that's why the big banks exist. If you are a, a big company, you know, I, I don't know where Microsoft banks they probably don't bank at First Republic or Silicon Valley Bank, right? And you know you have to bank <laughs> a huge bank in order to get huge credit lines and and this sort of thing. In fact, Silicon Valley Bank contracted with Goldman Sachs in order to do their stock raise at the time. So mm -hmm. you know small banks work with big banks, or just even remove the bank word. Small companies work with bigger companies when they need to do capital raises. It's just like when you go IPO. If your startup goes IPO, 
it's typically led by somebody, whether it's Goldman um, or, or you know another one of the big big banks. Um, and then you have these co-sponsors as well. And so big banks have multiple businesses that small banks, you know, the regional banking system does not take companies IPO. It's just not their model. Correct. So, but we need all these companies to make the, make the banking system go around. Yeah. Cause regardless of what we see in the media, the majority of small businesses being created aren't IPO companies. They're, they're right. barbershops. They're massage places, they're doctors, lawn offices. care, like, yeah, exactly. lawn care, landscape. There's, there's a lot more to the U S economy than what the Wells Fargo's and bank of America serve. Right. And I think, yeah, yeah, the big dollars attract the big players, but we have 330 million people, right. And a big chunk of them want to create their own business. How are they going to be able to access that kind of capital going forward? Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't see it happening in this higher interest rate environment because one regional banks suddenly have to overcompensate new depositors, right? Cause there's this risk factor all of a sudden putting your money in a bank that isn't one of those big four or five, right? Mm -hmm. So what do those smaller banks have to do? They have to up their interest rates, which makes mm -hmm. their lending, um, tighter. That makes it just cascades into so many problems that that SVB might have exposed or might have created. I don't know what yeah. we know, but um, I think regional banks have just a tough pathway forward. And I hope for the sake of our economy that they find a quick resolution because that they're yeah. so vital. What do you think is going to happen with First Republic? Total guess. I think they're going to somehow be saved. Total guess. Hmm. So don't don't go buy FRC, uh, based on that, because <laughs> I don't know. A, it's not a Vegas trade. Yeah. I, cause how many depositors do they serve and how many are thinking about moving their money because of fear of missing payroll, missing their mortgage payments. Those are real questions I would ask as a depositor and I wouldn't blame anyone for moving their money. That's that, mm -hmm. that kind of seems logical, but if enough of them move their money, the bank fails. And I think there's that, that, Cool old fashion prisoners dilemma, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll check back on that. Hopefully there's a resolution or at least some confidence back in that that company in the next couple of weeks. And then also, since the FDIC took over Silicon Valley Bank, you know, their intent is to sell it. And so at some point there's gonna be a buyer announced for the assets of that company. Obviously, we know the shareholders went to zero and many of the bondholders went to zero, which was a little surprising, but it happened. But the assets of the company will be sold. Speaking of banks getting sold, Credit Suisse was bought by yeah. UBS for basically nothing. So yeah. this was an interesting, fast, fast event that happened, and there was a there was a government loan, and then boom, a quick sale. Let's unpack this. Yeah, typically you would see a premium for a buyout, but yeah. Credit Suisse was sold for a tenth of what their current market value was. So yeah. UBS said, you're a toxic asset. I'm a, like yeah, walking by a garage sale and you got an old bike listed for a hundred bucks. Some guy gave you 10 bucks. 10 right? bucks and, and you took were, it. You gladly took it. <laughs> um, so Credit Suisse had quite a bit of a cascading downfall, completely unrelated to SVB. They took risks. If you want to talk about risk, they had Archegos, uh, um, a lot of family offices that not a lot, Specifically, that one, uh, Archegos, was highly concentrated, right? Did really well in the boom years in 2020, 2021. And when that trade unwound, all his concentrated bets went away. So mm. he, would, he the, the runner or the president of Archegos was funded by Credit Suisse. So Credit Suisse didn't do, I guess, proper management or due diligence with their book of business, right? Mm -hmm. They're very different from Silicon Valley Bank because they, they work with investment houses. Mm -hmm. So very different dynamic, but essentially it was a trade that blew up in their face. Right. Yeah, my understanding of that trade is that that was total mismanagement, poorly managed, yeah. bad bets, and it blew up. And then it caused a ton of extra risk on the rest of the bank. And then the bank sold for pennies on the dollar. 
So that one was bad management. Yeah, and for them to fail, it'd be like a our equivalent would probably be. Well, Deutsche Bank is running into the same issues. Uh, mm -hmm. Our, I guess, the U.S. equivalent would be um, Merrill Lynch failing. You know, even mm -hmm. though Merrill Lynch is, did get bailed out, it's 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 vital for custodial services. Yada yada yada. yada. Um, again, financial institutions have a very very big global impact if they fail or succeed, and I think that's what the importance of saving that at least the depositors of the SVB and then suddenly saving credit Suisse investors. Right. Um, but investors still lost out. If you own CS, you, you lost 90%. Yeah. So it's not like you came out of this unscathed, but I think propping that bank up in its assets was important. Why did that all happen now? Was that just, uh, 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 bad timing that it blew up a couple of weeks after Silicon Valley Bank, or what? What? Why did that happen now? I think it blew up before, and it, it before. was just just didn't hit the news. It was just uh, yeah, treading water, trying to survive, and Got I think it. Silicon Valley on the other side of the world, right? We're talking about a Swiss bank and a Silicon Valley bank, yeah. where one one shoe dropped and the other shoe was dropping. I guess this mm -hmm. is drop going to have to drop faster. And to mitigate any kind of spread, the Swiss government probably said, hey, UBS, go go bail us out by buying this toxic asset, mm -hmm. essentially. You reminded me of something a second ago that I just want to comment on for our, our listeners. We had said in a prior podcast, so the FDIC came out with a statement when they backed or backstopped Silicon Valley Bank, and they said there will be no cost to the taxpayer. And this is not a bailout. This is a backstop of the depositors. We're firing the management, you know, yeah. shareholders lose everything. And the way that that works is all banks pay into the FDIC, the FDIC, the I is insurance. And so all banks, depending on their size, pay an insurance premium, which then goes into a pool of funds. And that pool of funds is sitting there for this type of a thing. Mm -hmm. And so that pool of funds is what was used to then, uh, backstop Silicon Valley bank. So that's why taxpayers aren't on the hook for this. This wasn't a bailout of set of sorts. It was a backstop uh, yeah. again, using funds that were already set aside and allocated. Yeah. And I said it was a taxpayer pool, but yeah, you're right. It is an FDIC pool that it's an FDIC pool. Yeah. Again, it will get replenished with regardless of who funds it because it doesn't look like SVB found a buyer. So what they're going to do is break, break down all the parts and sell off the assets. So someone mm -hmm. will buy all those loans. Because those are pretty valuable loans. These are startups that have junk, junk rated credit, that are paying nearly ten percent on their business loans. That's pretty valuable, especially for cash, cash growing businesses. Interesting. Wow. Let's switch gears here for a moment and let's talk to let's talk about the Fed. So the Fed raised rates this this yesterday actually by 0.25%, and they signaled that they would slow and just do one additional quarter percent raise uh, sometime in the coming months, and then they would stop. I think that's generally good news. The market liked the first half of that, and then it ended up going down when when Chairman Powell kept talking for, I don't know what reason, <laughs> whatever, you know, whatever, it was an up-down day. So uh, what are your thoughts on this? Quarter of a percent increase, quarter to come, and then we're done. What do you think? I think the debate heading into this was the bank failure should have been a big sign that they hiked till something broke. And that's essentially what happened. That, that's the other party that could be responsible here. Their cannonball hit something. Yeah, yeah the cannonball hit something. definitely did. Right? They kept rates so low for 2021 when people were screaming, hey, get, get off the basement, right? 0% interest rates. Even if the economy is struggling to revive itself, which was the, the common theme for the Fed to push back from raising rates, all along with transitory, right? They saw goods inflation and said, that's going to subside. Yeah, they were right about goods, but they were wrong about services, right? And yeah. so they took another year to raise rates, and all of a sudden, you got transitory to be more permanent inflation. It went from raising rates from quarter point hikes to three quarters points hikes, right? Normally, it's a quarter point for a normal hike. We went 3x that for multiple times in 2022 and anyone holding bonds svb suddenly the bonds were less valuable and then 
you have assets that are below your liabilities and you're insolvent all of a sudden. Yeah. I'm I'm more than 100% positive that other banks, regionals and big banks hold lots of treasuries and they're all underwater right now. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so if you get another run, right? And again, I to the best of my knowledge, I don't think there's a another regional bank that isn't so tied to a single industry. Yes, there are, like um, the Midwest, like with the shale boom and oil companies in Texas. I think they're they're probably struggling now because oil's down pretty pretty sharply. Mm-hmm. But anything with a concentration of depositors that are reliant on profitability of one industry, I think that 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 could be another recipe for another bank failure. Again, the size of SVB, I doubt it, but. Uh, I could probably see that coming again with a lot of oil companies struggling right now. Hmm, interesting. Anybody that's owning, anybody that converted cash into treasuries is hurting. And that's a lot of companies. That's a lot of banks, obviously. Yeah. That's a, that's a huge, huge, yeah. Particularly if they have to sell whole nother yeah. debate on the whole mark to market thing with banks. Yeah, if, we, if you want to go to sleep, we'll, we'll do a podcast on that. Yeah, if anybody wants to hear about the whole mark-to-market <laughs> thing with, uh, with with banks and how they actually price their bonds on their balance sheet, shoot us an email. We'll talk about it. And yeah, if that becomes uh, a crickets thing, we won't talk about it. Eventually, they'll have to sell um, if the number of outflows does accelerate. It's just math, yeah. yeah. It hasn't really slowed. That's the concerning part. So eventually, if you have to touch assets that you were intending to hold until they mature. Like it's like cashing a CD early. You're going to get a penalty and how steep that penalty really depends on who's willing to buy that on the other end. Um, so I think, I think the contagion isn't done. I think there is a banking crisis that's kind of brewing. And again, it's the idea is not to spread fear, but it's just what we're seeing in flows. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's hope we can report back on that in a couple of weeks with a little bit less, you know, the, the flows are, are very fast at the beginning and then they slow. Let's hope that the velocity of that slows down. Yeah. And hopefully we're not reporting more and more banks dropping because of just flows. Again, this is a deposit issue. The, the money's just yeah. moving from one hand to another and that's the problem. Yeah. I want to touch on or come back to rates here and then we'll wrap. So Fed raised by a quarter. What happened with rates in real terms? And I want to spend a minute here because this is super confusing for our (laughs) listeners. Why, when, I don't want to spoil it. Why, when rates go up by the Fed, rates actually go down in the real world? So what happened with rates uh, yesterday when the Fed raised by 0.25? When the Fed raised by 0.25, most rates, and when I say most rates, I'm talking about uh, different maturities, three months, and up to 30 years, they all went down. The only rates that went up were the one month and the two month. And this is counter to at least, I guess, common knowledge or at least, I don't know. I think when I, when I see the Fed raising rates, I would expect rates to go up. It's, Mm -hmm. it's, (laughs) it just seemed very logical, but we're getting the exact opposite. So Fed raise rates, rates went down across the board, like pretty significantly. Mm-hmm. Um, so what that means is another tough headwind for banks is they have to pay at least to attract the money, shorter term rates. Right. But when longer term rates are going down, they are making less money on mortgages, car loans, things like that, that right. have a longer maturity than right. one or two months. And I think that's a double ding for banks because they essentially borrow short and then lend long. Mm-hmm. In a in a normal normal world, when I'm letting loaning Chris hundred dollars, right? Let's say it's one percent for one year, I would expect that hundred dollars to get more yield if I lent it out for five years. Mm-hmm. That's not the case. I, mm-hmm. I would actually make more interest off Chris by lending that hundred dollars for a shorter period than a longer period. Yep. Very you can strange. see that dynamic there. That That is highly unprofitable for banks because you're actually losing quite a bit of money if you loaned out money. 
So what are you going to do there? You're going to stop loaning out money as as rapidly as you did? What does that do if enough banks do that? Yeah. And I think that was the argument that uh, Chair Powell was saying, that the banks are largely doing their part in slowing down the economy for us. Yeah, he's quoted here, financial conditions seem to have tightened. Yes. And probably by, by more than the traditional indexes say. So he's saying that stringent lending decisions from banks could have a similar impact on future rate hikes from the Fed. So I think that's why they gave guidance and saying we're going to do one more. I want to explain just a little bit why rates went down when the Fed raised rates. So if you have a variable loan that is tied to a Fed metric, whether it's the Fed funds rate um, it is a common one, or, or it could be SOFR. So, yeah. yep, SOFR, which replaced LIBOR. These things are all tied to the Fed's influence to rates, and they influence these short-term or overnight lending rates. Uh, variable mortgages, for example, if you're past your fixed rate term, that will go up and down based on the Fed raising or lowering. But longer term rates are, we, we say this a lot uh, in, in sort of market or I guess Wall Street terms, but the market tries to price in these future predictions. And so when the Fed comes out yesterday and they say, hey, we're raising by a quarter today and we're probably going to do another quarter down the road and then we're done. The market previously may have thought that there was going to be a total of 1% of rate increases coming in the future. But now, based on this new guidance from the Fed, they're saying there's only going to be a half a percent rate increases in the future. And so the market reacts in, the, in that sense, and longer-term interest rates actually come down. Because again, the guidance is, rather than this 1% previous estimate, now it's only a half a percent. So that's why the words that are actually used when they deliver these rate hikes have such an influence on longer term rates. Mortgages went down yesterday, very counterintuitive. But again, it's because these the longer term guidance is that sort of the the terminal rate is lower than previously uh, previously estimated. I yeah, that and sense. that's driven by free market. I'm um, using a very specific example. Just a few weeks ago, um, a pension fund in Australia bought a bunch of 15 year U.S. bonds. They don't care what the Fed's doing. They're going to try to lock in a rate that lasts 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important for a pension fund, for insurance companies, for uh, sovereign funds, right? Mm -hmm. Lots of countries are buying U.S. bonds for their government, government sovereign funds, right? Because there's stability there. So I mentioned higher rates for shorter periods. That's only for a short period. If I lend that money to Chris for 5% for one year, one year down the line, I need I get that hundred dollars back. I need to reinvest that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Am I going to get five percent for one year? Most likely not. Right. And I think right. a lot of this dynamic of the longer end is free market driven, and big institutions are looking for stability because they just they're just going to hold it till till it matures anyway. Yeah, and I think that's that's the big thing that we saw was the bond market is suddenly pricing in more risk in the real economy than what the stock market is. And only one of the, I, I, it's a term I, I hear a lot is only one of those two can be right. Um, at least for the time being, I think the bond market is pricing in more risk than the stock market is. Hmm. And I think we should look at the bond market. I think, I think it's telling a, quite a few signs that we should probably be looking out for. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks everyone for tuning in. And uh, I wanted to mention as well, if there are any questions from our listeners, please send us an email at team at conciliowealth.com. It's team at conciliowealth.com and send us a question with what's top of mind for you. And we will address it on our next podcast.